Hello, today's video is about biochemical testing for carbohydrates and specifically we are looking at uh, a test that we can use to check for the presence of something that we call reducing sugars. Now, um, reducing sugars, here I've got a couple of examples. Uh, we've got glucose and fructose, which are both monosaccharides, lactose and maltose, which are both disaccharides. Uh, we've dealt with uh, those uh, kinds of sugars in a previous video, which you can watch. But these are all examples of what we call reducing sugars. Now, without going into too much detail about uh, what that actually means, um, what we have is some sugars that can actually donate electrons, uh, and that's what we mean by them being able to reduce other chemicals. And one of the chemicals they can reduce is something called Benedict's solution. Benedict's solution is a blue solution. It actually has copper sulfate that's uh, alkaline. That's been made, uh, that's in alkaline conditions, and this actually can be used to test for these reducing sugars, um, which causes this copper sulfate or the Benedict solution to turn into a red precipitate. So how do we do the test? Well, we have our sample here that we want to test. It can either be some food that's been crushed and mixed with water, or it can just be a solution of uh, our suspected uh, reducing sugar. We add a equal volume of Benedict solution. So in other words, the same volume that we have here, we, have, we add an equal volume of our Benedict solution and we end up with our mixture which we can test. Now what do we do next? Well we need to have a boiling water bath. So this is what we call a water bath. This is actually set up as a beaker of water that's been heated by a Bunsen burner. So it's bubbling away there at boiling point and we take our test solution we place it in the uh, water bath and after a few minutes if we have reducing sugar present we end up with something that may look a bit like this so here is a uh, change in the color caused by the reaction of the Benedict solution with our reducing sugar so this is basically a red precipitate precipitate that's come out of the solution. Uh, you may remember about pre precipitates from your GCSE uh, science, but this is a red precipitate that has been formed as a result of a reaction between our Benedict solution and our reducing sugars. So that's the way we use the Benedict's test to test for reducing sugars. Now on some occasions you might see that this is um, left in the water bath for a few minutes but it doesn't actually change color that actually means we don't have any reducing sugar present but it doesn't mean we have no sugar present we may have what's called a non-reducing sugar so we can use Benedict's test for a non-reducing sugar but we need to add an extra step now an example of a non-reducing sugar is sucrose and sucrose is a disaccharide that's made of glucose and fructose and as you can see from our examples previously both glucose and fructose are reducing sugars but how do we get the sucrose uh, broken down into uh, glucose and fructose uh, we could use an enzyme um, and we've talked about that before the enzyme would be sucrase uh, but in this case we can also use something called hydrochloric acid hydrochloric acid that would be dilute hydrochloric acid and this has the same effect as our enzyme might this actually hydrolyzes hydrolyzes the sucrose in the solution into glucose and fructose so we add our hydrochloric acid so there it is we can then actually heat this in a water bath and that will cause the breakdown of the sucrose into its uh, different parts, the glucose and the fructose. And then we can um, go ahead and do the test. We do actually have to neutralize this first. And you might do that by adding an alkaline. Well, you would do that by adding an alkaline. Uh, test it with pH paper to make sure it was neutral. And then you can go ahead and add your, where is it? There it is. Add your uh, Benedict's reagent or Benedict's solution. So there we have our test solution and in the same way as before we can then go ahead and put it in the water bath for a few minutes. If we then get our um, red precipitate we know that we have the presence of our reducing sugar um, or in fact we 
had uh, non-reducing sugar that was broken down into uh, reducing sugars by this process. Okay, so a quick outline of this extra step is to add an equal volume of hydrochloric acid, uh, place in the water bath. Um, we then neutralize, test with pH paper, add Benedict solution, and then again back into the water bath um, to test to see if we get the color change. Okay, so this is an overview of how we do the uh, Benedict's test for both reducing and non-reducing sugars with the extra step. Um, we also describe Benedict's test sometimes as semi-quantitative. Now, if something is quantitative, if we're measuring something that's quantitative, it can be measured by amounts or by numbers, and that gives us a good indication of exact quantities. We call uh, the Benedict's test sometimes semi-quantitative because we don't always get a uh, red precipitate like this. This, by the way, is copper one oxide, I think, I believe it is. Not some important to remember the name that's the name of the precipitate that we get but um, if we have a very strong solution of our uh, reducing sugar it might go all the way to this uh, quite bright red precipitate but if it's a weaker solution it goes through a set of uh, some phases of color so we start off with a greeny kind of color yellowy orange and all the way through to red but if it doesn't go all the way up to the red and only stops say here we know we've got a weaker solution of our reducing sugar. So for example, if I did a test, here it is, how strong is this um, reducing sugar solution in comparison to uh, what we have already over here? Well, it's kind of over just about reached this test here. So we could say that it's stronger than the first two solutions if we had uh, these measured out and it's not quite as strong as that one. What we can actually do here is we can do this test with known solutions. So we've done the Benedict's test with a 0.5 solution, 0.5% uh, solution of our reducing sugar, 1.0, uh, 1.5 and 2. Uh, so we know the color that we're expecting. So with this one, then we can actually um, estimate that it's around about a 1.5% concentration of our reducing sugar. So in this way, we say that the test is semi-quantitative. The last thing I want to go through is a test for starch, and that's our potassium iodide solution test, um, sometimes referred to the, as uh, iodine solution. But we have a, pot a potassium iodide solution, and we can use this to test for starch. And this very simply works by having a solution of starch. We can add a couple of drops of our potassium iodide. This is actually like a yellow or a pale brown color. Um, and it reacts with the starch in the solution and produces a result where we have a blue black solution. So if we obtain this blue black solution with the addition of potassium iodide solution, we know we have starch present. In actual fact, you can also put a drop of our potassium iodide on some bread. That's supposed to be a slice of bread. Uh, whatever. Okay, and if we get our blue black spots, you can see that starch is present. That actually works quite quickly. And you can see that um, you may have done that in class before. Now, knowing this test is quite simple and straightforward, what they often ask you to do is maybe apply this idea to an experiment. So I've got one here, which I've seen um, before. What I've got is a dimple tray or a dimple tile, which is just basically a small plastic tile or ceramic tile that has these little wells in there. And uh, in each of these wells, I've got a mixture of starch and amylase solution. And this is carried out at 10 degrees centigrade, and these all represent minutes. So I've got a mixture of starch and amylase that's been uh, kept together for two minutes, four minutes, six minutes, eight minutes, ten minutes, and so on. And if I add a drop of my potassium iodide solution at these time intervals, I can see a set of results. And you can see that starch is present all the way up to 12, between 12 and 14 minutes. The starch has disappeared after about 14 minutes when I have the mixture at 10 degrees. And this is a result of the amylase breaking down the starch. And you may remember the amylase breaks starch down into maltose. Okay, so we could then repeat the experiment this time at say 30 degrees. Again, we've 
take the test solution out at these various times and we can see the effect of the temperature on our starch and amylase solution and you can see that the amylase sorry the starch has disappeared much more quickly this time because we've got a warmer temperature for our enzymes to work in we will be looking at enzymes much more in much more detail later but this is a, a kind of an example that you might see where the potassium iodide test is used uh, applied to a experiment that you have to interpret okay so that's um, the video done for today thank you for watching and i'll see you soon